Okay, welcome. My name is Josh Humphreys. I'm president and senior fellow of Croatan Institute, an independent nonprofit research institute whose mission is to harness the power of investment for social good and ecological resilience. I'm really pleased to facilitate today's session on redirecting private finance for the UK's post-Brexit agroecological transition. And I'm joined today by um, a really interesting and diverse group of, of practitioners uh, in this in this arena, um, including Anna Vanderherd, uh, director of the A Team Foundation, Tony Greenham, uh, director of the Southwest Mutual Bank, and Sue Walker, relationship manager in in agriculture for Triodos Bank in the UK. Um, I'm I'm really excited about this. Uh, uh, panel in part because uh, it gives us an opportunity to, to foster a conversation about a project that the A-Team and a group of other thoughtful UK foundations has been uh, funding over the last year as part of the Farming the Future um, collaborative of, of funders, um, focused precisely on this, on this question of deploying new forms of capital, private capital in particular, impact investment, mission-related philanthropic capital into the, the gaps that are associated with the badly needed agroecological transition that we face and made even more pressing in, in the context of Brexit and the exit of uh, the UK from the UK, from the EU's common agricultural policy. Um, so I'm really excited to foster this conversation and the way we're going to organize this um, over the course of the next hour is um, basically as a conversation, there won't be any slides or presentations, it's really going to be a dialogue. And we have uh, taken the option uh, to have um, a 30 minute breakout session afterwards uh, in Zoom. And so our, our colleagues in the chat uh, will facilitate that transition at the end of the hour. And we'll be joined in that session by an additional set of colleagues from the New Economics Foundation um, with whom we're working closely on this, uh, this project actually uh, to analyze opportunities and challenges associated with deploying, uh, deploying private capital, particularly bank lending uh, into agroecology in the UK in this context. Uh, so we'd like to simply begin by, um, by allowing each of the each of the panelists to say a little bit more about themselves, um, what exactly they do at their organizations and, and what brings them to the conversation today. And, and I'd like to begin with Anna Vanderherd. And Anna, you may be muted. Okay, sorry, that's the first um, slip. Hi, my name is Anna Vanderherd and I'm the director of the A-Team Foundation. And we have been looking at food in relation to human and environmental health for over 10 years, predominantly as a grant giving family office based in the UK. And uh, through our journey looking at food and health, um, about six years ago, we started to really concentrate on food systems. And that um, has led us to a lot of work um, supporting agroecology in the UK and a little bit internationally. Uh, with other donors in um, an, an collective format when we're, um, when we're funding internationally. Uh, and we came together with a foundation, uh, the Roddick Foundation, a couple of years ago to really look at amplifying our work in the UK around agroecology. And we were looking at all types of finance going into agroecology, which included our grant streams, but also looking at our investments. And so it was through conversations that I'd actually had with Josh and I was aware of the work that he was doing supporting other um, philanthropic, but also institutional finance going into agroecology or regenerative finance. And um, through conversations with um, Sam Roddick from the Roddick Foundation and the work that she'd been looking at with her own bank and work that she had conversations she'd had with NEF, we came together, the Crotan Institute, NEF, um, Roddick and ourselves and uh, several other foundations to really start to address the, um, how other investment could go into agroecology, not just through the grant sides of our foundations. And so we commissioned a piece of work that Crotan and NAF are working on now. And it's looking at both institutional finance um, in the UK, going into agroecology or regenerative, finance, regenerative practices, 
but also looking at how foundations um, can shift their portfolios into more regenerative practices. So um, that's why we're here today to discuss to discuss this work. Great, thanks, Anna, and thanks so much for your generous support of this um, of this kind of initiative. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Tony Greenham. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so I'm Tony Greenham. I, I've got a number of roles relevant to this discussion today, actually. So uh, my day job is as executive director of Southwest Mutual, um, which uh, I have to, um, in case any regulators are in the room, uh, correct Josh, we are not yet a bank. We are seeking a banking license. Um, and so we're in the pre-application phase. Uh, but that'll be a bank, uh, customer-owned bank serving the Southwest of England. But I also work with the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And hopefully some of you will have seen colleagues already at this conference and come across the work of the commission. It's an independent commission that's looking at how we can transform the UK's food, farming, countryside uh, towards a much more um, sustainable future. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll also mention a couple of other things which are of interest, which is um, an initiative amongst UK banks, including Triodos, actually, and, and which I sit in, called Banking on a Just Transition, uh, which is hosted by the London School of Economics. Uh, but that's showing that actually even amongst mainstream finance, there is a growing awareness of, of the need for quite significant change in, in what is being financed by banks to, to lead us towards uh, a just transition to net zero. Um, and finally, I'm a senior fellow of the Finance Innovation Lab, which, um, which looks at how to um, have more purpose-driven uh, finance in the UK um, overall. So a um, number of different touch points for today, uh, but I'll, I'll particularly be bringing up the work um, with the Food, Farm and Countryside Commission about the transition to agroecology and how we can redirect finance to support that transition. Great. And um, introductory remarks from you, Sue. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you, Joss, for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. Um, although relatively well known within the Oxford real farming community, on a global basis, I'm not sure how well known Triodos Bank is, so I thought I'd give, give everyone a little bit of background. The idea around Triodos Bank came about in the late 60s, when a group of intellectuals in the Netherlands came together to research how money could be managed in a more sustainable manner. In 1971, they established the Triodos Foundation and used both gifts and loans, a little bit like what you could today describe as crowdfunding, in support of new and exciting sustainable projects. Triodos Bank was formally founded in the Netherlands in 1980, when it obtained a full banking license from the Dutch Central Bank. We now have branches across five European countries, including the UK, which was established in 1995, and with last year being our 25th an anniversary. A little bit muted, more so than expected, obviously, because of the, the current situation. In 2009, Triodos World Bank also co-founded the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, which is an independent bank, independent network of banks that use finance to deliver sustainable economic and environmental development. The bank's key mission continues in the same manner today to help society that protects and promotes quality of life and human dignity for all by means of ethical banking. As a bank, our overriding mission is to make money work for positive change. And for that, we only finance companies and projects that have a positive impact on people, the environment and culture. Driddest Bank does not utilize the wholesale money market to raise capital. Instead, we, force, um, we source funds from um, a, a market known as the common retail market through individuals and organizations that same the same, share the same values as us. And we believe that when you entrust money with Triodos Bank, you know that we're doing it, um, we, what we're doing with it, and we publicize every project we lend to to create a fully transparent link for the savers to the projects that we finance. So I joined Triodos Bank seven years ago after spending 18 work years working for one of the main high street banks. I won't mention which one. I work as a relationship manager, better known as a bank manager, specializing in food, farming and trade related transactions. And for the last seven years have looked after the majority of our agricultural farmers and projects in the UK, including organic dairy farms, mixed farming enterprises, 
organic farms with an element of diversification through something like green tourism or smaller scale environmental projects such as wind turbines, solar panels and biomass. In addition to traditional bank, to traditional bank lending, i.e. savings versus lending, Trados Bank also has an investment management arm based in the Netherlands, which has been active in the sustainable investment sector for 25 years. Trados Investment Management, better known as we call it as TIM, managing investments ranging from sustainable energy infrastructure to microfinance institutions. Individuals and companies in the UK can invest in the likes of the Trados Global Equities Impact Fund, the Pioneer Impact Fund and the Sterling Bond Impact Fund. Also within Trados Investment Management is the Trados Organic Growth Fund, rec recently renamed, renamed as the Trados Food Transition Europe Fund, which invests in the transition towards sustainable food production and consumption. In the UK, our corporate finance team also runs a crowdfunding platform, which is very important, where individuals and businesses can invest in specific projects for return on investment. A strong area of focus is that of natural capital, and we're working with the likes of DEFRA, the Environment Agency, and Esme Fairburn to raise funds of up to 10 million in support of projects working with the Devon Wildlife Trust restoration, the Rivers Trust working on natural flood management in the Y catchment in Lancashire, the NFU, NFU's work on reducing nitrate pollution, the Moors for the Future Partnership restoration and conservation of peatlands in the Pennines, and the Triodos Renewables Fund, renamed moving forward as the Triodos Energy Transition European Fund. So we work in lots of different angles, but the overriding thing for Triodos Bank is its mission. Its mission to help create society and protect and promote quality of life for human dignity for all. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> thanks, Sue. And thanks, everyone. And, and I'll, I'll uh, reciprocate in turn. Um, so I, I lead Croatan Institute, which is uh, an independent nonprofit research institute based uh, in in the United States. Um, our core team is is based uh, in North Carolina, and uh, we have team members across the U.S. South as well as in the Northeast and New England and in the Upper Midwest. And we also have a presence in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, I'm also the co-founding senior strategist of the Institute's Organic Agriculture Revitalization Strategy also known as ORS, which really aims to reframe certified organic food and agriculture as, a, as an inclusive economic development strategy for revitalizing rural places. Uh, and that work has really been piloted in the US South and then the kind of methodologies that we developed around financing entire organic value chains has been replicated and extended across the US uh, in, in particularly in the upper Midwest uh, in in Wisconsin and and on the West Coast, um, and we increasingly are are thinking globally about connections and and obviously um, let's just say for better or for worse, Brexit provides an opportunity to think a bit more concertedly and deeply about uh, Britain's relationships with the world, um, not just with Europe. Um, and uh, there are certainly interesting opportunities associated with British American relations in what we hope to see will be a new administration inaugurated shortly in the United States. Um, <clears throat> but obviously, I think both the, the UK and the US are going through a certain a certain level of unprecedented political turmoil um, outside of wartime, um, which really provides the, the framework in which we're doing this, not to mention the global pandemic um, that we face. So we've got a wide array of challenges that we're dealing with. And we've got multiple forms of transition, um, I think, and, and I think Tony will say a little bit more about that related to the climate, the climate crisis, as well as our ongoing democratic political crises. But there are huge opportunities associated, you know, with um, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, deeper forms of organic agriculture. And I, I think the simply because I, I am based in the U.S. and um, I think it's not a secret that Anna and I um, are neighbors here in the other Durham in, in the United States. Um, um, you know, I, I think there's a huge opportunity to think about what 
in fact, is the, the crucible of the problem of deploying private capital into the agroecological transition in the UK in particular. Um, it's not a coincidence that we have a leading European bank um, that is probably known as one of the most innovative uh, banks um, when it comes to this sector. That is to say, not a UK-based bank, <laughs> although technically it is now in the Brexit context. <laughs> Um, that's an interesting problem in itself. It's also an interesting problem um, that um, we do see in the UK um, as we spend a lot of time talking about government funding in uh, the transition from the basic payment scheme associated with the common agricultural policy, um, which simply funds agriculture rather than funding good agriculture to this new post-Brexit um, environmental land management scheme system, um, which purportedly will be providing public funds for public for public goods and public acts um, in agricultural land in the first, you know, agricultural act that Britain has has had, you know, in in a half century. Um, it's an important opportunity, but I think the kind of capital we're talking about um, in the public financing side is still dwarfed, to be quite honest, by by private finance. Um, you know, there are um, according to the latest DEFRA stats that I've seen in terms of um, in terms of lending and liabilities that British farms actually have on their balance sheets, um, something like about 10 billion pounds um, are coming from longer term uh, bank loans and another 2 billion pounds um, are coming, you know, from uh, basically, you know, bank, bank drafts, you know, overdraft uh, kinds of loans, lines of credit. Um, and then you also have, you know, a variety of different uh, forms of private, you know, trade credits um, and and the like. Um, and this is in a twenty billion dollar um, lending constellation. So more than half of uh, the kind of financing that's being deployed right now is, in fact, coming from the private sector, from from private banks, or in in many ways in the UK now, um, these are public banks, to be quite quite frank, post financial crisis. <laughs> Um, because they're owned not only by shareholders, but by the state. And I think that's a that's an important thing to keep in mind. But I think um, Sue generously, <laughs> you know, alluded to high street banks, um, you know, which she was. But I think there's a real crisis in confidence with high street banks. I think there's a crisis in customer service in high street banks. And I think there's a real opportunity um, to deploy new capital. And I, I think that's one reason why Tony is here representing this um, this emerging you know, opportunity to regionalize banking in a way that that the UK really hasn't seen in the past. Um, and I think Anna may be able to talk a bit more um, over the course of our conversation about the real problem that we see um, for UK funders who care a lot about uh, deploying their capital as mission related investors. They simply do not have investable vehicles in the UK in which to deploy their capital. Um, and so the paradox is that if you wanna do mission related investing, around climate uh, climate related um, agroecology, um, many funders tend to turn to Europe or turn to North America or Australasia as the place in which to deploy their capital. And there is a very robust and thoughtful group of sustainable, responsible and impact oriented farmland managers who have created professionally managed strategies and funds to invest in agroecology in these other markets. And it's a growing uh, it's a growing uh, universe of, of opportunities. Um, so part of uh, this inquiry um, that we're embarked on in the course of this year with the New Economics Foundation is to determine why precisely it is that we do not have the same kinds of robust ecosystem of private finance um, that supports agroecological transition um, supports organic transition, supports regenerative organic agriculture in the way that we're seeing in other geographies. Um, so with that, um, I'd, I'd like to, again, curate this conversation um, over the space of our, our next 40 minutes um, by beginning with Anna, who I think brings a, a real bird's eye view into this problem as, as a foundation leader. And so I wonder, Anna, if you could describe a bit more fully for the audience the Farming the Future initiative and the broader problems of philanthropic mission-related investing in UK agroecology and, and how it's shaped your, your interest in developing the Redirecting Finance Project. Yes, of course. Um, 
So, in, in fact, as I was just sitting here listening to you, I was reminded of conversations that Ruth West and I had had many years ago, uh, looking exactly even before Farming the Future and our conversations, Josh, which was looking at uh, slow money in the US and why we didn't have, um, why there wasn't even a slow money happening. Um, so, uh, the, I, sorry, one second, I'm only seeing me, so can everyone else? Anyway, um, okay, there we go. Um, so yes, Ruth West and I had had conversations years ago just saying, you know, why aren't there even the vehicles of slow money happening in the UK? And that sort of started the conversation which led to loans for enlightened agriculture. And so that was probably about four or five years ago that we were having these conversations. And so thankfully through, um, through the Real Farming Trust, they set up LEAP, which is Loans for Enlightened Agriculture. And that was the first vehicle that the A-Team could invest in in the UK, which was looking at small loans to, um, small to you know, smallish loans um, to agroecological businesses from, from farm to fork. And so um, that was kind of uh, dipping our toes in within the UK. And, you know, but it's still a small fund. It's, it's a million pounds. And so that's a really a drop in the ocean of what is necessary. Uh, and then so conversations kept ensuing and we gave some, you know, some loans to the Ecological Land Cooperative for land purchase. Um, but again, you know, we keep looking and looking for other opportunities in the UK. The problem is, is we're a small family office. So the due diligence process, if we're to give tons and tons of little loans out, that would not be possible or manageable um, for us as a, as a foundation, as there's only two members of staff and, and several trustees. And so we're really looking at opportunities that are being run by others that have the capacity to do the due diligence and to, and to follow up and really have the business acumen and the financial acumen to be able to run the vehicles. Um, and so these conversations were happening in the background. And then uh, Sam Roddick and, and myself from the Roddick Foundation were talking about really how we could collaborate on supporting um, the movement of agroecology in the UK. Predominantly at this point, the early conversations, you know, we were looking at, at grant finance, but we really wanted to open that up to how we could support the movement um, in, in multiple types of finance. And also Sam's doing a lot of work on the communication side of things as well. So how we can sort of um, support support the movement from multiple angles. And it was through conversations with Sam that we were looking at, well, what about the institutional finance? You know, who who we bank with and who Roddick banks with and who other foundations are banking with? How are they investing? What does that portfolio look like? And so that started the conversation about um, how we could, is it possible to influence how they're, um, how they're, how they're investing? Do they want to shift and change? Um, and understanding, you know, that that really regenerative or agroecological solutions are the solutions that we need to see in, in farming uh, in the UK and, of course, internationally as well. Um, but the banks seem to lag and institutional finance seems to lag about investing in, in them in the UK. So um, Farming the Future is, is, a, is a group of donors in the UK um, which are looking to, as I mentioned, uh, fund the movement of agroecology in the UK through pooled uh, grant funding and um, and then collective grant. So the, the grants are also um, are, are looking at uh, partnerships between the different uh, civil society groups. And, and really it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a iterative it's a learning process. I mean, we're in the second, we've just given the second round of funding, uh, grant funding, and we're really looking to grow this side by side the work we're doing in finance. Um, but just in terms of the, the reason we've looked, as I mentioned, you know, there really wasn't much um, for us to fund um, from a capital side in the UK yet, apart from the loans that we've been giving. And so we have been looking in the US. I live in the US. So, you know, that gives me a certain vantage point of what I can see here. Um, and we have funded some things in, in, the, in, the, in Europe. But we really, really would like most of our capital to go to investments in the UK. So... Um, you know, it's an ongoing process. <clears throat> Great. I mean, it, you encapsulate well the dilemma, uh, I think, that that we're increasingly seeing. And as this conference has, has highlighted repeatedly, um, this is really a, a global opportunity, right, to invest in agroecology, not only in places like the UK, but in the global south. Um, <clears throat> there were separate sessions about that. 
as well. But in the Brexit context in particular, there are unique problems that that obviously have arisen that that now sharpen sharpen the focus around transition. Um, and so I wonder, Tony, if you could say a bit about the dilemmas of transition as, as you're um, observing them. Um, I've kind of teed it up broadly. I mean, you wear a variety of different hats. So uh, not only creating a, a kind of incipient uh, new regional bank, um, but also, you know, by leading the finance work at the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, you're focused uh, quite heavily on, on exactly these kinds of gaps. Um, the commission, as many people have known, have actually proposed a, a, a national agroecology, agroecology development bank uh, in order to, to catalyze public finance uh, alongside uh, private banking. Um, and we've heard, you know, broadly from farmers in the field um, that, um, you know, we have in the UK, an agricultural mortgage corporation, uh, but what's needed is something like an agroecological mortgage corporation. Um, I wonder, um, and also not to mention, you know, our, our climate transition that we're going through. So I just wonder, you know, in in light of all of this broader dislocation that's happening, Tony, um, why do you see a regional bank, um, a regulated depository institution, um, as as right? sized for responding to these kinds of challenges at this time? Sure, well, I, um, I will answer that question um, but by going through a, a couple of things to get there, if that's all right with you. But, I, but I'll start with the point you make about the context of, of Brexit. And I guess um, for me, it does sharpen the focus um, on the need to, or the opportunity to reinvent the subsidy system. Um, and is that going to be, uh, you know, encouraging the sorts of transition to agroecology that we want? But also, um, I think particularly right now, it's focusing minds on food security in a way which in the UK is something that's always simply been taken for granted. You know, supermarket shelves are always full of produce no reference to seasonality really from everywhere in the world flown in shipped in whatever and that's what consumers are used to and that's what policymakers um think uh it almost has happened automatically but of course with brexit we've seen how vulnerable uh, supply chains are and indeed with with covid as well potentially so um I hope, I hope this 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 you know leads to a much more welcome focus on the question of food sovereignty for the uk um so these are all you know, create a context in which hopefully change is more possible uh, rather than less. Um, in terms of agroecology and, and the need for finance for it, I think it's just worth um, setting out some sort of broad assumptions that I think we, that we're working with at the Food Farming and Countryside Commission. Um, the first is that, and this <laughs> probably doesn't need saying at this conference, but that agroecology is, is both good business and good economics. Um, we published a report called Farming Smarter that set out in detail the case for why that is true. Um, but we felt that was necessary because there are still widespread sorts of um, perceptions, if you like, um, amongst mainstream finance um, and possibly the public and press and so on that, that agroecology is, is somehow a sort of, um, you know, it's a worthy but fundamentally unprofitable or uneconomic thing to be doing. Well, that's absolutely not true if you look at the fundamentals. However, there are uh, many systemic lock-ins and barriers that are preventing um, us migrating towards this better form of business uh, and better form of economics. One of those, but only one, is access to appropriate finance. Now, for some farm enterprises, um, you can self-finance uh, a transition to agroecology because of course if you're freeing up cash flows from reducing your chemical inputs then then often that can that can finance the other needs you have but our view is that that might be true and, and some businesses certainly are being successful on those terms uh, if we're going to have a, the kind of pace and scale of transformation of uk agriculture that is necessary not just to hit our carbon targets but to produce healthy food that can feed the nation um, and also provide the sort of preserve cultural heritage and provide good quality employment and all the other things we need in the countryside, then finance will be required to make this shift. So um, coming on to the sort of question why we think a new bank might be needed or, or indeed more than one new bank actually, it's worth just sort of thinking about what the banking system in the UK can currently deliver. 
um, before I sort of want to look at, well, what are the gaps and what would good look like for banking? And then finally, of course, what's beyond the remits of banks? I mean, well, what do we need other than what bank finance can do? Because that's that's only part of the picture. Although, very as you outlined at the beginning, it's a it's a predominantly an important part of finance. It's, it's just good old fashioned bank debt. So, um, what can the banking system deliver now? Well, you've already pointed to this actually. Is that the UK banking system is very unusual by international standards in lacking diversity. It's it's very dominated by a small number of national or global high street banks. We don't have local lending institutions uh, or banks particularly, uh, which are commonplace in other countries in the world. And we don't have the, tend to have the sort of, therefore the specialist banks that particularly um, have a depth of knowledge about say, agriculture or um, agroecology in particular. So we lack that diversity and that's one of the problems. That said, you know, if you are a larger farm, if you've got collateral, you own your own land, if you're just doing business as usual, access to bank credit hasn't really been a problem for you. Our, our research has indicated that if you are a smaller farm, if you're a tenant farmer, if you're a new entrant, and by a new entrant that could mean, um, you know, family succession, so sort of the kids take over but don't have a track record, or most importantly of all, I suppose, if you're seeking to transform your farming methods, then uh, then it's a bit more tricky to access um, bank credit from, from the big high street banks. I mean, I'm, it, it, Trios is an honorable exception for this, of course. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are, and there are players in the market like Trios with some knowledge, so, so that's great. But, but, it, but nothing like, I think, collectively, the sort of scale that we need and, and the diversity that we need to, to meet all of the various needs in the market. So what would good look like? Well, there's two, there's two problems, really. We, we need more forms of institution that are understand in depth particular localities and regions and also understand agroecology that can um, make good lending decisions and have good relationships. And that's where Southwest Mutual comes in, because although we're not a specialist agri agriculture bank, we are a specialist regional bank or seeking to be that really understands Cornwall, Devon, Devon Somerset and Dorset you know, uh, and all its sectors. Um, for, given the nature of that region, the transition to uh, agroecology uh, is, is one of our central uh, parts of our mission. But also you mentioned the work that the Food, Farm and Countryside Commission has been doing on um, a proposal for a national agroecology development bank. And this is because we think that there, there's a, a need for tailored products uh, for farming enterprises that um, have already adopted agroecology or more particularly are making a change towards it. And in the same way that the British Business Bank has specialist products to support SMEs and startups, which all of the, the banks and lending institutions in the UK can distribute. We think um, that there's a strong case for a specialist um, set of products for agroecology. So we'll be publishing more on this at the Commission uh, in the coming months as to how to both in, uh, have a greater diversity of institutions that are mission led and, and have a good regional knowledge as well as agroecology specialism, but also the right products to offer them. Which leads me to the final thing which I wanted to say, which was, um, well, that's so far, we've just been talking about loans. Now, loans are important and they're really suitable for lots of transactions and forms of financing, but not for everything. And particularly, perhaps not entirely suitable when we've got this transition to new farming methods taking place. There's a lot of uncertainty potentially around that. Um, of course, you get the famous thing, although we're used to this with organic conversion, of course, where you may have a gap in revenues whilst the conversion is taking place. So you need, you need to have a good understanding of the dynamics of that. A couple of people in the chat have noticed have raised really good issues about models, which I think is common in agroecology, where you've got a diverse model, sort of revenue streams for, from lots of different sources, perhaps. And, um, you know, are you going to have a relationship lender that understands that complexity? Um, and also uh, another question in the chat I noticed was about venture capital. So really, we think that there's going to be... Um, a need for grant finance, uh, there's going to be a need for equity or at the very le least a sort of patient loan capital that genuinely shares risk and maybe has more flexible sorts of repayments. And as Sue will attest, I'm sure that kind of finance is nigh on impossible for a bank, a regulated bank that takes people's savings in to provide. So we need, we must have this good blend of finance 
um, that, that can match bank, bank debt with other forms of finance. Um, but just to wrap up, you know, it's not just about that, because I think in order you can have all the right financial products, they're ready and waiting. But if farming enterprises, farming entrepreneurs, farmers aren't supported, if you like, um, to, to be ready to, to make use of those products, then nothing's going to happen. So we're, at the commission, we're equally focused on how we can support the entrepreneur, how we can support farming businesses with you know, the technical skills they might need, with business advice and support, uh, with encouragement, you know, peer support and mentoring. You know, if you're the first in your peer group in your region to go to agroecology, it's a bit uncomfortable because you're not doing what your peer group doing. Um, and then also not lose sight of the fact that this is all taking in place to come back to the Brexit point within a ch potentially changing set of market incentives as to what farmers are rewarded for doing and what they're penalised for doing in the actual market for food products um, and how they and how they uh, and, and the nat payment for natural services. So, I was quite a lot to cover, but um, you know it's a complex landscape. I think that UK is possibly worse off than many other countries in. Um, in having too rigid a uh, sort of a narrow set of financial structures and then did Anna set that up very well to start out with. Um, and that's something we really need to change. It's something that the, both Southwest Mutual and, and the Food Farming Countryside Commission is really focused on. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the, the models that we're really interested in um, at the Institute and, and philanthropic capital really encourages is what in the US is known as integrated capital. Um, a variant of which, um, or, or it could be seen as a variant of, of what in the UK is often known as blended finance, um, that really develops, um, you know, capital stacks that um, have a variety of different risk return profiles that can, in, in fact, include philanthropy, um, can include grant funding that really doesn't expect a, you know, a financial return on the investment but also can mobilize program related investments, concessionary debt, that is to say much more patient forms of, of debt, um, but also a variety of forms of equity finance, if that's suitable for um, whether it be a land transaction where there's ownership, you know, farmland investment of that sort um, or forest land investment for that matter, um, or in the value chain. And, and we should keep in mind that, you know, this is not simply, you know, and, and bank financing is suitable, not just for investing in farms, but investing in the whole agri-food sector. And, um, you know, it's one useful reminder in the COVID context, um, you know, is, is that agricultural labor obviously has been highly impaired um, in this Brexit situation. Um, but it's by an order of magnitude um, larger the agri-food sector than agriculture itself from an employment perspective, right? So we're, we're not just talking about, you know, the declining number of farmers and, and farm labor at about 400,000 in the UK. We're talking about more than 4 million people who are involved in the food sector. And there are huge opportunities, obviously, to finance that sector as well. And private equity, if it could be more patient, um, you know, could play a major role as a value chain source of capital um, across the capital stack, across asset classes. Um, and indeed, potentially in, even into the public markets, um, both public debt and and public equity. Um, um, and so we're we're keeping that in mind as part of a, a potential longer term engagement. But obviously, you know, Tony, you've you've really highlighted some of the problems um, with banks. And and Sue, you're uh, you've got a target on your back now because uh, they can say whatever they want. They don't actually you know run people's money. Uh, you actually are on the front lines of working with farmers. Um, but as you described, you're you're a Dutch bank. It's kind of an, an interesting um, and, and curious position to be in. Um, you know, domiciled. You know, your parent company domiciled in the EU now. Um, you know, how is Brexit? You know, changing your business model um, as a Dutch bank. Um, why? I mean, why do you think, um, given your high street bank experience, um, that it requires you know <laughs> a foreign bank to do this work that the high street banks are not? As um, as concernedly, specifically around organic, you obviously do a lot of work around organic lending, um, and and how how are you viewing <clears throat> sort of the the credit um, the credit accounting sort of the underwriting? I recognize you're not a you're not a loan officer per se, but um, how does this transition into what is really an uncertain Elms kind of um, kind of situation? You know, how does that also play into things here? 
Thanks, Joss. Quite quite a few different questions there. Um, I think the first thing I'll think about is or talk about is um, again back to Trudos Bank. Um, you are correct. We are a European bank, and Trudos remains committed to supporting sustainable banking in the UK, um, despite Brexit. Um, historically, we have traded as a, a, a UK branch of the Netherlands, which is where our, our head office is, and we have been regulated by the Dutch Central Bank. Um, we operated under what they call the passporting regime, made possible by, by EU agreements. Now that the UK has left Europe, we can no longer operate under this system. Um, following the referendum in 2016, Trudeau started working with the regulators to ensure necessary regulatory and legal framework was put in place to allow us to continue trading in the UK post-Brexit. Post uh, post and then on the 1st of May 2019, Trudos Bank was granted a UK banking license to operate as a subsidiary company wholly owned by Trudos Bank NV. This was an incredibly costly exercise, um, which only further confirms the bank's commitment to supporting sustainable banking in the UK. Um, with regard to agriculture, um, as I'm sure everyone is here away today, but um, aware today, the biggest challenge Brexit has for for us as um, um, a bank and for agriculture is the subsidy system, also better known as you know the, what historically was the basic payment system. Um, the changes that um, are, are coming into place will have a lot of implications across the country for all sorts of different farmers. And these farmers will need to learn to adapt to changing from claiming payments based on the amount of land that they farm to the new approach, which has been discussed under ELMS. For, for us as a bank, this creates quite a challenge um, to a certain degree, um, as it, we have to look more into detail about customers' viability um, and ability to service debt. So, um, when we, when we, well, as you've mentioned, Joss, in the UK, um, you know, there's a whopping, was it 10 million funds that have lent out um, in terms of loan funding in the UK to agriculture, further 2 billion in terms of overdraft lending. I suspect that actually might be a little bit higher, but coming down because banks are less keen to, to provide cash flow lending via overdraft these days because there's no repayment source in place. As a regulated and licensed bank, we have a huge amount of responsibility in how we lend. And since the financial crisis in 2008, regulations have tightened up further and long gone are the days when, farm, um, when as a farmer, you can approach a bank such as AMC or one of the high street banks and say, I've got 200 acres of land. Please, can I have a 20 year interest only year loan secured against this land? I have no ability to service the capital repayments in the short or long term. Um, that, that no longer happens. Key when assessing any lending now, um, as most people are faced with and do begin to understand now, is that as a bank, we have a responsibility to confirm that that individual business, individual or business, um, or farmer, has the ability to service that debt. Um, as Tony mentioned, there's a lot of profitable organic farms out in the UK or profitable farms um, out in the UK full stop. Um, and for that, and for those farms, we can easily make available loan funding for land purchases, infrastructure and worker capital in forms of overdraft lending. Um, we are provided with a healthy set of accounts and budgets, which can, confirms farm viability and ability to service loan repayments. Um, we also look for customer contribution in the total project costs, which can come in the form of personal cash reserves, possibly in grants that have been made available to them. Um, or existing equity in the form of property and land that they might have that they can contribute towards the project. In most cases, we also look for a secondary source of repayment. I would say actually in 99.9% .9 cases, we look at uh, for a secondary source of repayment. So primary source of repayment is abilities, businesses' ability to be able to service the debt. And that's not just servicing the interest on a debt, but also to be able to service a regular capital repayment on a debt. And then in addition to that, we also look at the business's ability to serve a loan repayment, whether that be over a short term dependent on the project or a long longer term dependent on, you know, 
whether it be a, a, a kind of a land purchase or putting up new buildings. Um, in some cases, we'll also look to take a charge over business assets, no, you know, stock machinery, we call that an agricultural charge, but that is not what we could do what we would consider tangible assets so it does make it a little bit more difficult for us to look at that um, especially when it comes to smaller businesses or newer enterprise enterprises so for smaller farms um, and less profitable farming businesses um, raising finance can be a challenge and it's not that we as a bank don't want to help those it's just that we are regulated to be able to confirm we have to confirm people's ability to service loan repayments and also we can't um, we can't supply 100% funding so in which cases if you're a new entrant and you're starting up you need to have a bit of a ca bit of cash behind you to put into your project or you need to maybe have some wealthy family that can support you by other means um, we look for annual accounts um, which um, confirm that the business is solid and financial protection projections which will be heavily scrutinized and sensitized to confirm viability of their project as i said ultimately we need to be able to confirm the individual or business's ability to service both interest and capital repayments on a debt before we consider lending so i think that's another really key area that sometimes people don't really understand um, it makes it a challenge for a lot of small farming enterprises um, and then going back to Brexit and the changes of subsidy system, I think it creates a lot of um, challenges for the smaller farming enterprises. Um, I, I believe about 75% of farming enterprises in the UK are reliant in one form or another on a form of subsidy payment. Um, when we look at accounts, we look at historic accounts and we could tell from historic accounts what that person would receive in terms of the payments, um, basic payments or any other um, environmental payments that they, they will achieve. And we can then um, put some faith in the projections moving forward that, that that money is guaranteed over the next seven years. That creates a new challenge for us then because obviously we're going through a transition period. The amount of basic payment will reduce over a term and the customers are going to need into enter into two, two arms, into new agreements. Each individual farm will be different. So each individual farm will need to be assessed differently. Um, I hope that answers your questions. You're on mute, Josh. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sue. Um, absolutely. Um, obviously, Brexit is having a lot of different ramifications, you know, on the bank as a whole. But I think you're also highlighting how how Brexit is is creating uncertainty, even with your existing lending model, um, in ways that I think reinforces Tony's point that that um, Britain could benefit from a much more diversified banking sector. But also, we need more than just bank finance uh, to help with the agroecological transition for small farmers and new entrants. Yes, totally. <clears throat> and those that that may not have the means to to meet those service requirements. Um, so in a way, that invites us. Um, as we move into this, you know, last uh, last twelve minutes or so, um, I think it invites us to move back to Anna on the philanthropic side because obviously that's an important um, important component of the kind of work that you're doing. You you actually have been financing not only initiatives like the Real Farming Trust uh, Leap Leap Fund, but also um, a variety of other interesting. Um, cooperatives like the Ecological Land Cooperative and others that are trying to provide land access uh, to farmers so that they don't have to be burdened by by that um, by that problem. Um, but how is this kind of the you described, Anna, I mean, at the very beginning that this is a broader problem, right? There's a lack of slow money in the U.S., regardless of whether the U.K. is still in the in the European Union or not. So there's a longer term problem, but it seems like things are 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 becoming a bit more pointed with with Brexit. So I, I wonder, you know, specifically in terms of the A team and farming the future, how how Brexit is affecting your your thinking about you know capital formation and deployment uh, into the sector. Uh, I mean, through Farming the Future, you know, we have supported a lot of organizations that have been working on the agricultural bill. So, uh, you know, the Land Workers Alliance, Sustain, uh, Pesticide Action Network UK, uh, Sustainable Soil Alliance, um, and, um, and, and, and many more. So 
they, um, you know, in terms of supporting organized civil society groups that are looking at the transition um, post Brexit, that is what one of the one of the reasons for the vehicle of farming the future. I mean, essentially, it's supporting civil society, civil society looking at food and farming in the transition. So um, that has been a very important part. And what's what's sort of brilliant to see from our side is that ten years ago, when we started looking at food and health, human and environmental health. There were several foundations looking at it in the UK, but it was predominantly, you know, the, the bigger ones were Esme Fairburn and the big lottery, who which had a food strand at the time. And then there were several others. Um, but it's always been quite niche. Um, you know, we did us as um, with several other foundations in two. We did two surveys and the first survey, I believe, was in around 2011, 12. And it, only, it showed that one percent of philanthropic funding was going into food and farming. And I think in 2017, it showed that 2%, you know, so that's tiny, tiny, tiny amount of philanthropic funding going into food and farming, um, which, but I see the momentum. I mean, I see, you know, I, I of course, I'm within the movement. So I, it, it, perhaps there is the echo chamber, but I really do see this acceleration of people getting interested uh, in food and farming for the first time, um, you know, seeing poten the potential for the climate solutions, um, but also, you know, in terms of just seeing, you know, how the just, you know, how we essentially, from an equity perspective, um, environmental perspective, a health perspective, how it really does offer so many solutions if done right. Um, and so we will continue to support the civil society groups that are really pushing forward on the transition to a fairer food system. And um, uh, in terms of the, you know, there's some really interesting questions coming coming out from the group, which I'd like to address just a couple of them. Um, and I think in terms of getting, you know, there's one suggesting, you know, how do we get farmers to work beyond the farm gates? I mean, I think many are, um, but then, you know, others don't have the time. So, again, you know, we're using um, the, the platform of Farming the Future sort of to link up all different groups in food and farming and have them work collaboratively together to really enhance the work that they're doing. So, for example, the Land Workers Alliance, which is predominantly supporting, you know, agroecological, um, small to medium sized farms in the UK, they're linking up with so many different initiatives um, to really sort of to, to, to see how their work can be bettered by working in collaboration. And, um, and then in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, I'm just going to address some of the other questions because I know we don't have much time. But there was the the Mad Ag question. So the perennial fund in the UK in the US, which is looking at supporting farmers in their transition finance transition years, moving from um, parts of their farm from traditional uh, agriculture, industrial agriculture, you know, mm -hmm. using pesticides and inputs to organic. Um, they are working predominantly with farms that already have, you know, a, some of their farm already that has transitioned. Um, but we see great scope for this. We're looking to support this to fund it in the US and we would love to see this in the UK. So and the Mad Ag team said that they jump on the next plane as soon as their fund has been uh, launched in the US. But obviously we want to see it coming from the UK, the ground, you know, ground up as opposed to sort of just having something come from the US and sort of planted in the UK. I don't know how well that's going to work. Um, it needs to be place based. So, um, you know, it needs to emerge from within, you know, it's like we can't, um, we can sort of have the conversations um, and, and hopefully these things will emerge. So I know we only have five minutes, so I'll let Tony finish up. Yeah, and I just a reminder to everyone um, that in conferences like this with uh, thousands of people, we may not always be able to tackle every question, but again, we have reserved a breakout room. So those of you who are not moving on to the next session who would like to actually um, have a chance to interact uh, more fully with us um, about these questions. Just know that we are reserving that, and and um, our our colleague Kushal in the in the chat is going to provide the link. Indeed, he's I, I believe he's just done so. Um, so know that at the end we'll we'll do that. But as Anna rightly said, Tony, feel free to um, um, grab a question if you want. But I think more importantly, respond to the same question that I kind of posed to. Um, to Sue and, and to Anna, though, from from your perspective, um, you know, specifically around around this transition related to Brexit and and the Agriculture Act opportunities, you mentioned the national 
the Agroecology Development Bank as one one opportunity there. But um, I mean, how are you thinking about this this transition? Um, you know, from from the basic payment scheme to to the Elms, um, you know, subsidy system and, and well, that you're doing. I, I have to put my hand up and say there are other colleagues on the commission far more expert in, in the transition to, to Elms and I to comment, to be honest. Um, but I did want to pick up on something Anna said and, and the, the chat pointed towards perennial. I mean, that's one of a number of um, examples in the US which you know we find inspirational and I think there absolutely is a space for these sorts of models in the UK and that's an active line of research at the Commission as to whether we could trial um, you know integrated capital or blended finance as you say through through that sort of vehicle as Sue and I have both pointed out banks due to their regulatory structure are not able to offer the degrees of flexibility and innovation alas um, that things like the perennial fund represent um, but but nevertheless you know bank debt can be a good stable cheap, cheap form of funding that is in the mix you know uh, so I think we need to sort of uh, find vehicles which we can um, which I think need to be regionally based that might look a bit like the perennial uh, fund and mad ag and other examples um, that can can bring us all together so I think you know and with a team and others we we should definitely take that forward um, there was a question about pension funds, which is a great question. Um, local authority pension funds are slowly beginning to look for more um, impact related investments. Um, it's it's painstakingly slow. The problem there is, um, well, some of the problems to the philanthropic sector, actually, it's deal size. There's a sort of certain size at which a pension fund needs. I mean, they want to do a 10 million plus transaction if you're a pension fund. So again, what we're lacking is the vehicles into which local authority pension funds could invest, um, that then that vehicle disperses those funds in its various forms into, into uh, agroecological transitions. So um, part, another way of looking at the same potential problem, I think, there, I think there are big pools of capital. I mean, this is always said about social investment in general, but it does feel that there is potentially the capital out there ready and, and willing and seeking uh, how to get behind agroecology um but we just haven't got the market structure set up to, to let the money flow to where it needs to flow um somebody did raise a point about you know how much external fund finance do we want to load on to farming businesses um and and historically there might be high levels of debt because of the insane land prices in the uk uh We'll have to do another workshop on that problem because <laughs> that, that, that you know the land price in the UK is a whole separate issue which causes pain across a whole lot of sectors including farming right now but um yeah I mean I think let's bear in mind that sort of I my, for me ultimately what our research shows what people know and the questioner pointed out is that ultimately agroecology's you know is more profitable and it's and 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 it's better for biodiversity and it's better for carbon and it's better for soil and it's better for health and it's better for communities so um when we get there, all the finances will be fine. Uh, it's just bridging the gap between here and there. Yeah, and I'm um, uh, I'm curious, uh, Sue, if you might like to have just the last word, and then I would like to invite everybody to to join us uh, in the in the Zoom breakout. Oh, you're on you're on mute, Sue. Apologies, I didn't realise I muted myself. I thought I was being muted centrally. Um, yeah, no, this has been a really, really interesting discussion, and it's great to get that together with other people that work in sort of within types of financial institutions or grants, um, and are looking at equally looking at finance um, for agroecology. Um, I think. Um, Tony is right. I think there's lots of um, opportunities out there. I think actually now um, and the change in the subsidy system is very, very, you know, should be treated as a positive. We can't look back at what was in place previously, but we need to adapt and, and, and learn to adapt to what's coming in um, moving forward. I think there is lots of um, positive elements to, to ELMS um, and I think there's lots of positive elements for those new entrants coming into farming. Um, and um, you know, again, we as a banker, we 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 continue, we you know, we continue to want to support UK agriculture. It's a really, really important, um, important on our agenda. Um, and you know, um, uh, uh, and I and I hope that you know, sort of moving forward as things change, it gives opens up new opportunities for new people coming into agriculture moving forward. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you for ending on a hopeful note in times that are not always uh, feeling the most uh, the most enlightening. <laughs> um, so let me uh, let me end by thanking Sue, Anna, and Tony again for joining me today in this really um, really critical conversation about the role of finance. Um, for those of you who are not able to join us, uh, I hope you enjoy the, the balance of the conference here on the last day. And for those who would like to continue the conversation with us and with our colleagues at the New Economics Foundation, please uh, click on the, the Zoom link, uh, which I'm going to do right now myself, and see you there. <laughs>